This time on Rad Drive Video, we're answering a few of your questions, including how do we save the local skate shop? Let's get to it. Welcome back to Rad Rat Video Channel. You can learn new things about skateboarding, talk about all kinds of stuff on this channel, including some stuff that you guys send in through this series, Ask Rad Rat. The first one for you today is from Boy, who says, do you think all public skate parks should allow bikes? I personally think they all should. I'd like to hear your thoughts on it. I'm a little conflicted about it because it's not really, like I don't wanna stop anyone from doing what they wanna do. And if I was a BMXer, and there was a place with ramps and stuff that I wasn't allowed to go, I'd probably go there anyway. But I see the the opposite side of it too. So there was a town near me growing up in uh, Michigan where they were gonna build a, a skate park. And um, the city wasn't gonna pay for it at all. All they were gonna do was let the skaters use an old, um, an old uh, court. It's like a, a, a tennis court. They were gonna let us use that but the skaters had to raise all the money to get it. And so um, like different, they would go to different uh, like fast food places and have a little donation thing that you could do. And it was like $40,000 they needed to buy some ramps, which is way too much considering what we got. But um, it went through all this stuff and it took months and months and months. I mean, from when they talked about it to when it was done, it was probably at least a year or more. I don't really remember. This was like 12 years ago or something like that. But um, when we finally got it, it was just these flimsy pre-made ramps that they bought online somewhere. And then they just plopped them in this uh, really crappy tennis court. And uh, eventually they paved a new place for it. It wasn't flat, it was like on a hill. And there were treads from all the tractors that they used to like pave it so you couldn't roll on certain spots. Anyway, skate park sucked. But it would have sucked worse if the bikers came in there because bikes can destroy stuff right away. You know, um, with this, it was like, you know, pre-made boxes with coping on it. If the coping gets messed up, you could replace it, but they wouldn't have considering how the skaters had to pay for everything themselves. But imagine like a concrete skate park um, where all the coping has chunks, you know, torn out of it from all the bike stuff. Uh, if you can't skate it on your skateboard, then what are you going to do if the city is on top of it and they're going to repair stuff and they're going to like maintain everything and make sure it's still skatable then great but if it's the kind of place where they're just going to build it and let it go and let it sit for the next 30 years without touching it having bikes there is going to be a problem for all the skaters so i don't know that's a tough one if i were in charge of rules at a skate park uh, I'd probably say no, but I'd understand that they'd probably do it anyway. So I don't know. It, it kind of depends. It depends on what else is available too. If it's like a tiny little town, nothing but dirt roads. I mean, BMXers can make dirt tracks and stuff like that, right? So I don't know. That's a tough one. I would prefer them to not be at a local skate park for that reason, but I'd feel real bad about saying no too. Okay. Next question is from Joe DeWill. Do you think tricks still count if they're done standing still? I've always felt that doing a trick standing still is a first step toward, toward learning a trick, and it still takes a lot more effort to learn the rolling version. The classic skate videos never featured still tricks, even really hard ones like, like Rodney Mullen's impossible late varial flip. But these days I see videos all the time of people doing crazy tricks standing completely still, and it just feels like cheating to me. Well, it is cheating, but it's not really a thing like you think it is. There's probably two things that you're seeing. First is the uh, still trick challenge, which is just a meme. It's just, you know, someone walks up to a board, does a trick, walks away. I did one too, although my trick had to be stationary because it has a Casper in it. But like, um, that's just kind of like a show off thing. Like, oh, look, I just saw a board. Let me th do a trick. And it happens to be a crazy trick. And then you walk away like it's nothing. That's just like a social media trend. That's not a skateboarding thing. Um, although it's interesting that you've see you see it that way. Cause now I'm wondering if people who are just starting to skate right now are seeing this stuff and they think that that's how skateboarding is supposed to be done. Um, which it's not, it's just like a fun thing that people do. Uh, which is kind of interesting. Uh, the other thing you're probably seeing is one guy named uh, Jamie Griffin, who is one of the best flatland skaters ever. And he happens to live in a place where it rains a lot. So you see him 
doing tricks on a rug in his garage and you can see it raining outside, but then he does it outside. So like he'll do an impossible under flip late flip. It's one of the craziest things I've ever seen. He did that in his garage or shed or whatever. And you might, you might've seen that, but then a day or two later, he did it outside rolling. And so that guy, his stuff gets reposted a lot because it's, most of it hasn't been done ever or even thought of by anybody before. So of course it gets reposted even though it's stationary. So like, with those two things, one is just like a social media thing and it's not really, really what skateboarders are skating like and the other is just one guy who does it because of his circumstances. But combined, if you're scrolling through Instagram and on skateboarding stuff, you're going to see a lot of stationary tricks, which is weird. Yeah, it is a little bit interesting that uh, that is a thing, but don't do it. Like if you can go out and skate normally and do tricks rolling, then do that. But um, yeah, it's not how you're supposed to skate. It's just kind of a stepping stone. I, I don't, I'll do some stationary stuff if I have to, you know, like in, in my house, I have a sidewalk that goes from my back door to my fence. My uh, driveway is gravel and uh, that's it. I have a front porch, but there's a huge crack in it. And it's also like, there's a bus stop in a school right there. I don't really want to be like falling, doing tricks on my porch. Of course, it's also really small. So I'd fall and fall down the stairs too. But if I were to try to skate at home and that was my only choice, I could either skate on my sidewalk, which is very thin and you can't really roll on it because it's so old and busted up. Or I could skate, you know, on my carpet. Um, so like I've posted stationary tricks before too, because it's literally all I could do uh, for at that moment. So, you know, it's just a thing. It's something you do when you have to do it. I'd rather do stationary stuff than nothing, but obviously rolling tricks are more legitimate, obviously. All right. Next question is from Callum. Have you heard of the, the Andy Anderson Paul Peralta skateboard with a unique shape? If so, do you think it's the most beneficial shape for street and freestyle? So I'm answering this one because people have been sending me this guy's board, not the board, but comments about his board a lot because I mentioned on a video before that I can't find a good street freestyle hybrid board and a lot of people suggested this one to me and it's really really interesting so on the braille channel they talk to him and he walks through the board and all the features that it has so like the tail is is flat but then there's an extra corner and that corner is there so you could do a a, a pressure flip because there has to be something between the wheel and the corner if you pop that part it'll actually flip so that's put in there on purpose and then it kind of tapers but then comes back out and that part coming back out is so you can stand on on the rail and it'll still be flat but you still keep the taper also that little part comes out because of the way concave works it's actually taller than the rest of it so you'll lock in on a dark slide and then the nose is uh blunted like it's not flat is flattish, but it's rounded because when you do a truck stand, um, your front leg w w is in the way. So the board can't be perfectly straight. It's actually out slightly. So the tail is a little bit rounded so that you can find that right spot for balance. And it's got all these features that are designed for lots of tricks like that. And I think it sounds awesome. Um, I haven't tried one yet. If I ever see it at a skate shop somewhere, I'll probably pick it up. For me, the problem is the size. Like it's really, really big. His act, the one that he uses is like a nine and a half or something like that. Uh, he's got a smaller version. I think it's eight and a quarter maybe, which for me is still kind of on the bigger side. When I first started skating, um, all I could get is like seven and a half and seven and three quarters. So getting into the mid eights still feels really big to me, which is not great for freestyle. So what he does is more of a, a hybrid where he does like a freestyle trick but he'll do it on a bank or something like that. Um, and like, that's really cool. I love his skating. He's one of my, my favorite skaters to watch, but it's like the board has to be bigger and work in a certain way so that you could do both at the same time. Um, for me, it's more like I want to be able to do pure street and pure freestyle separately, you know? So like having a bigger board and trying to do like a really technical flip to rail or like, you know, Casper flip to rails, stuff like that helps to be a little bit on the smaller side. So I love the concept of that board and I love all the design and thought that that went into it and I'm really impressed by it and I want to try it. But for me, I'm not sure that would be the perfect shape. Um, I mean, maybe I'd love to be proven wrong on that. It could be, um, but it's really cool. And I, I just, I love that shape because growing up, if you started skateboarding around the time I did, or like in the early nineties, even 
uh, you might not realize that there's other shapes other than popsicle shape. That's all we had, and that was like, we've perfected skateboarding. That's it. There's nothing left to be done. And then you see a board that looks nothing like a regular skateboard, and yet it can work better in certain ways. It's such a weird thought for me, and probably most people around um, my age too. Like shaped boards and stuff have only been a, coming back for the last five years or so. So if you grew up before that, um, it's kind of weird to, to picture that it might be helpful to have a non-symmetrical board um, that has like features, you know? But uh, yeah, I don't know. It's really cool that that exists and I would love to try one eventually. Okay, next question today is from Travis, who says, first off, I love your channel and your perspective on skate culture changes throughout the years. Well, you'll love the last video I just recorded. Uh, he says, my local skate shop closed down recently, but they seem to focus only on shoes. So I'm conflicted on whether it is a sad thing or not, except for when it comes to now, where the only other skate shops in town are big chain stores and the shopping malls. Are there successful local skate shops or is this a thing of the past? Um, when I was growing up before the popularity of the X Games, we only had access to a skate. The only access we had to a skateboarding shop was a CCS catalog. What do you think makes it takes for local skate shops to be successful? Yeah, I was the same way. I grew up on a dirt road in, in Michigan in the middle of nowhere. There was a place uh, at the mall. It was not Zoomies, it was before that. It was some weird thing. I don't remember what it was called. Uh, but the mall was like an hour away from me. So I basically ordered everything on the internet. But skate shops are facing the same thing that any kind of specialty or hobby store is, like bookstores and stuff like that. Like, why would I go to a bookstore if I can pre-order it online and get it the day it comes out? I don't have to leave my house, it's just there. Or uh, I can get it on my Kindle within seconds the minute it comes out. Um, like, why should I go to a bookstore? They have to have reasons. So, like, if you go to a Barnes & Noble now, there's a lot more than just books. They've got all the, like, they have hobby stuff. Like, you can buy a Dragon Ball Z statue. You can buy, like, um, the one, I think it's in all the Barnes & Nobles. I don't know, just the one by me. But there's the Criterion co collection of films. There's, like, classic films that are all, like, re remastered. It's one of the only places you can get those. So they got films. They got, like, vinyl. They have, um, you know, like, board games and stuff like that that brings people in. And, yes, there's all the books. But if it was just books, it would fail, um, like a lot of other bookstores have. Or any kind of ho hobby shop. Game stores are kind of the same way. Uh, you know, it's mostly just game stops now. There's a couple things here and there, but they don't just sell games. They have to sell like, you know, specialty stuff, like really old collectible games. They have to sell like, you know, the toys and the merchandise and the and Pokemon cards and Magic the Gathering cards. And maybe they have a little comic book section. Like they have to branch out and sell other kinds of stuff. And that's just kind of what it is right now. There has to be a reason for you to go there instead of just you know, clicking on it and having it come to your house. So what would that mean for skateboarding? Um, that's a tough one and I don't think you'll like it. So there is a skate shop by me that is pretty cool, but like the first room is all skateboarding stuff. It looks like a normal skate shop. There's shoes on the wall. There's decks hanging from this other wall over here. Some clothing racks in the middle, normal skate shop. But then there's a second room where it's all skates. And so it's like, caters to skateboarders and um, that uh, the thing where they all like race and they punch each other and stuff. Like that's a big thing around here, I guess. I don't know. But so they cater to both of those things and um, they have different kinds of things that aren't skateboarding that are there. So it's like, it's a normal skate shop. You can buy a shop deck that they make. They buy blanks and they put their graphics on them and stuff like that. It's, you know, the people who work there are probably skaters, but they have some other stuff. And so that's what keeps them afloat as far as I know. I mean, I haven't talked to them. I don't know their, you know, profit ratios and what sells best for them and stuff like that. But it seems like that kind of thing is more of a big deal. So what would you do for skateboarding? Like I'm thinking like a, a game store has, you know, the rare collectible games that you might want to put on your shelf. If they had old skateboards from the eighties that you could buy and you could hang them up on the wall. You don't necessarily want to buy that on eBay. It'd be cooler to go look at it and feel it and you know, know that it's not going to get damaged more in shipping if you buy it on eBay. That type of stuff. Um, or just branching out into other things. And I know a lot of skaters don't want that. You don't want to walk into your skate shop and see like, 
you know, school textbooks over there or something, you know, but that might make sense in a certain, in like a college town or something like that, that might make sense. Or you don't want it there to have like an art section. Lots of skateboarders are into art. Maybe you sell like paint markers or something in the, in the other room. I don't know what that is in your certain area, but competing with the, uh, the, the stores online, competing with the mall shops is tough. And there has to be a reason to go to yours instead of theirs. It's, probably impossible to compete on price because if I don't like the price on CCS, I can go to active ride shop or something like that. Right. But your shop is your shop. So there's gotta be something different that makes it a cool place to go. Maybe there's like events that you host people meet up and they go to whatever together, like that type of thing. How do you get people in there outside of just buying skateboarding stuff? And I think that's the only way that it could work. So, um, yeah, that's been seeing, you've been seeing that in a lot of different types of hobbies and industries and types of stores and all that it's happening in skateboarding. And I think it's going to take a lot to make sure that your local favorite shop doesn't shut down too. But those are the ideas I have. If you have any more, put them down below. If you have any more questions for a future video, either go to radratvideo.com and submit it on the form on the homepage or you can support my Patreon and there is a thread on there where you can submit questions. I will definitely answer those, whether it's in a video or just as a message, it will depend on whether I can talk about it on camera or not. But uh, yeah, you can do that. And in the meantime, until my next video, here's some more videos YouTube thinks you might like. You can tap my logo in the middle of the screen to subscribe. You can even like the video too. I never tell you to do that, but it, has, it does actually help a lot. So thank you for watching.